What's up, kinfolk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Welcome to the number one ranked show. And since you are here, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever it is that you listen to, watch the show, whether it's YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever it is you get your podcast, wherever it is you are listening to us. You can also listen on the Fox Sports app. You can follow us on the socials where Javion is doing that work, man. At number one show on the Twitters, at the number one show on Instagram, Facebook, wherever it is that you want to follow us. We're always asking you questions, getting your opinions. And we're going to get to that a little bit later where I just straight up asked, who would you pick, Kyler Murray or Vince Young? And it became such a big to-do with Vince Young coming over the top to tell us what's really good, which I'm very excited about. We're also going to talk with Coastal Carolina head coach Jamie Chadwell about his team in 2020 coming into our lives as the Cinderella story du jour and going into 2021 where we know about them now. They're not going to sneak up on anybody in a very good Sunbelt conference and going to get a little bit into group of five teams I think are most likely to win a college football playoff spot with the four-team playoffs still being very much the thing that we're doing at least for the next couple of years. But hopefully when we get to a 12-team playoff, it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to get group of five teams, multiple group of five teams into this here thing. But first, I'm going to tell you how to win the Jim Thorpe Award. And I am a selection committee member and executive council member for Oklahoma Sports Hall of Fame's Paycom Jim Thorpe Award. So that's the disclaimer, right? But I still want to tell you how you can win this prestigious award. So story. The first trip I ever took on behalf of the selection committee for the Paycom Jim Thorpe Award was to Sanford Stadium to watch Georgia versus Notre Dame. I traveled with my friend David, a fellow member of the committee, and it remains one of the best experiences that I've ever had covering the sport. At the time, Notre Dame safety Kyle Hamilton had already started to receive buzz and UGA safety J.R. Reed had walked on in Athens only to ascend to captain of the defense. We needed to find out about those men and others. The staffs, fans, and coaches for each team could not have been kinder, especially when they found out who we represented. And we weren't shy about saying who we were and why we were there. You know, for that game as opposed to others. We approached fans at tailgates, at concessions, at the stadium, asked everyone I could the same question about the best corners and safeties on their team. We stopped at one tailgate and I asked a group of them to tell us what they know. Tailgating college football fans being some of the most honest and transparent, good-natured folks in the world. What's he like when he's not wearing the Black Panther suit? I asked. What do you mean? A UGA fan said. I told them we all know what a star player is capable of when he dons the mask or face mask, when the claws are out and it's time to fight back right now. I wanted to know though, what is the man like on challenge day? I wanted to know about the brother, the student, the friend, the teammate, the philanthropist. What's he like in class? What's he like in a crisis? What's his mama say about him? Who are his friends? Who aren't his friends? Can you depend on him to keep his word? A UGA fan holding a beer looked quizzical. She said, what do you want to know that for? On Tuesday, June 29th, 2021, the ballroom at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum was full. I'm a guest at one of the most prestigious athletic banquets in the country. There are state senators seated, CEOs of large businesses mingling, and heads of banks shaking hands with 2020 Thorpe Award winner and Texas Christian cornerback former Trayvon Merrick, just they're shaking his hand bow, just a little too long for my liking. As the winner, he's the guest of honor, and we rolled out our dignitaries and our wares for a man we've dubbed an honorary Oklahoman. Merrick became the 36th player to win the award since it began in 1986 that bears the Thorpe name, and only the first Texas Christian Horn Frog. He was an advanced analytics darling and the highest graded safety in the country, according to Pro Football Focus, with 47 tackles, two picks, and nine passes defended. He beat out finalist Patrick Sertan and Richie Grant for the award. He joins former winners Deion Sanders, Charles Woodson, and Roy Williams as the best defensive backs in the sport. In a tuxedo, and the only man in the room with locks like mine, 
He followed 2019 winner Grant Delpit's introduction for him with an acceptance speech laced with humility and pride. I'm accepting the award, but I couldn't do it alone, he said. It took a village. In addition to the bronze trophy of James Francis Thorpe with the Carlisle Indian Industrial School C emblazoned across his chest, Merrick received a Rolex from B.C. Clark Jewelers and a set of cowboy boots and cowboy hat from Tenor's Western Outfitters, all from this state, from Oklahoma. That's where Jim Thorpe is from, too. It's from this state. And it's where his given name in his native Sac and Fox Nation is Wathahuck, meaning Bright Path. He was born here near what is Prague, Oklahoma in 1887. He was raised here. When Thorpe left here, he led Pop Warner's Carlisle program to an 11-1 record in 1911 with wins against Yale, Princeton, Harvard, Navy, Brown, and of course, Yale. Against Harvard though, the school's oldest country, or the oldest country, oldest university in the country, he scored 18 points, which was enough to beat the Crimson 18 to 15 in what was considered an upset in front of their 25,000 fans. He won Olympic gold medals in track and field. He is still the only athlete to compete in 17 events and the first man to be stripped of his medals because he was a professional baseball player, which is asinine and stupid. He started in what would become the NFL, and though he played many positions, his best on a football field was defensive back. He is an inaugural member of the 1963 Pro Football Hall of Fame class. The Associated Press named Thorpe the greatest athlete of the first half of the 20th century ahead of Babe Ruth and Jesse Owens. In 1999, the AP ranked him third best athlete of the 20th century behind Michael Jordan and Babe Ruth. In case you never thought a large group of people could both be wrong and change their minds. At the banquet, though, Oklahoma Sports Hall of Fame president Mike James reminded attendees he tells this story often enough that I know it as well as anybody not named Mike James does too. One day in 2011, James was eating lunch with Jack Thorpe. At the time, Jack was the chief of the Sac and Fox Nation, son of Jim Thorpe. Patrick Peterson won the Thorpe Award that year, and Jack wanted James to tell him about Peterson's 2010 year. James began to rattle off Peterson's statistics, how Peterson had stacked 42 tackles on top of four picks, a 29.1 yard kickoff return average, a 16.1 yard punt return average, and had run back two punts for tutties. Jack stopped James before he could continue to talk about the superhero Peterson was on the field. He said, no, Mike, tell me about him. James obliged. He told him Peterson was like, well, a good dude when he wasn't wearing an LSU Tiger jersey, when his helmet was stocked away in an equipment room when the lights at Tiger Stadium were off and the stands were empty. James told Jack what a wonderful young man Peterson was, and he couldn't have been happier to do it. But James suspected another motive lay at the marrow of Jack's question. Mr. Thorpe, James said, I probably know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask anyway. Why did you ask me that? Mike, Jack said, from now until forever, that young man's name is going to be associated with my family and with my father. That young man is going to represent my father earning the Jim Thorpe Award. And it's important to our family that he's a man of character and a good man. James understood and allied Jack's fears. Mr. Thorpe, he's a great man. Since that day, James has told men like me, fortunate enough to sit on the award selection committee and executive council, that story. Not only does he tell it, he's sure that it's at the front of every conversation we have about men considered from the watch list to the three finalists that we send to nearly 400 voters to select each year's winner. Just last fall, Peterson donated several hundred meals to the biggest homeless shelter in Maricopa County in Arizona. 51% of what we evaluate as a selection committee, as levers of the sport and zealots for defensive back play has nothing to do with football and everything to do with character. We do our level best to find out who each one of these men is when they think nobody's looking. Most are like Peterson, but some let us down. But they won't do it before we award the winner each year. And we hold our perfect record with utmost sincerity and seriousness. When kiddos ask me, how do they win the Thorpe Award? My answer is always, 
be the best man possible. The other 49%, we evaluate on the basis that our guy has to run backward, drop his hips, pivot, and get from zero to 20 plus miles an hour while staying in the hip pocket of the fastest wideout on the opposing team. Then our guy has to tackle like a middle linebacker, come off the edge like a defensive end, all while being able to catch the ball with the wideout he's usually running with. Means our guy is good enough to win the Heisman Trophy by definition. Football is tilted toward the offense, but in the rules and in the rewards, we shouldn't have that. No one knows that better than Texas Christian head coach Gary Patterson, who has found Merrick and really shaped him into one of the best defenders in the sport each year, as he has done with many other players. The highest compliment Patterson paid Merrick is never having to create situations where he needed help over the top or underneath. He could play sideline to sideline in one-on-one -on -one situations and didn't bust his assignments. Matter of fact, Trey is one of those guys who allowed you to play the game by the rules, Patterson said. Sounds simple, but it ain't. Doing the right thing isn't always, and neither is playing defense on a football field. In fact, it's hard not to cut corners, to study, to treat each person you meet as someone you must care about in the Ubuntu definition. I am because you are. That's not just one of the best football players in the land. That's one of the great men in this vast universe. That's a Thorpe Award winner. All right. Now, let us talk with Coastal Lara Carolina head coach, head of the shots, the shot clears, the rocket doodles, Jamie Chadwell. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are y'all today? Uh, we're good. Uh, excited to have you on. And I'm really interested to first figure out how it is you are navigating this June of recruiting as we're seeing unprecedented levels of, well, travel. And for the first time, rising seniors being able to go to official visits during the summer. How has that helped you guys get a better feel since the 16 month period of the dead period ending June one? I will say it's actually, uh, even though it's been tiring, it's actually great to be back seeing players compete and do things like you miss that, that up close personal relationship, actually getting to see them do things. So, uh, you know, for us, we've been on the road a bunch. I, I think we went to six different uh, camps at other people's <clears throat> universities. We've had, uh, three of our own will be three tomorrow on our own campus. So we've had nine camps we've attended. Plus this will be our, <clears throat> excuse me, our third weekend of official visits. So uh, we've probably had on campus after tomorrow, we'll have anywhere between a thousand and 1500 student athletes that actually came on our campus. And we probably had a chance to evaluate anywhere between the same amount of number, about 2000 plus over the last month of June. So it's been, it's been hectic, been tiring, but well worth it. And you know, when it's good to be back out there. How do the kids look to you? Because a lot of them haven't played high school football and this is their first opportunity to really get out there and do something. You know what? I actually, I actually think they probably look better. And the reason why is even though they've not had a, a lot of opportunity, maybe to compete or play, some of them obviously got to depending on what state they're from, but they all have these personal trainers now. So they all got to really work on actual specific skills. You know, and so you'll come in and, you you know, this guy might not play much. Man, he knows how to do this drill, knows how to do that drill. So uh, I've actually thought it's been a little better than maybe what you thought just because of the of the beautiful thing of social media. Everybody knows what you need to do to be great, and they can go do it on their own, and they can hire somebody to help. Goodness me. Now, I'm excited to see what they look like come the fall, but I'm really excited to see what your program looks like come the fall, and I want to take it back just a little bit here because – we're getting to this place where we're talking about a 12-team expansion of the college football playoff, which, you know, still has to work itself out. And they're going to actually bring this back in September as they continue to evaluate it. But it looks like we're headed in that direction come hell or high water. To that, I say, according to the policies that they laid out, went ahead and did this work myself, y'all would have been the 5-12 matchup against Notre Dame. How do you feel about that? I mean, just being able to go on the road to a place like South Bend and have an opportunity to play for a national title in an otherwise, I think, closed off system. I mean, how awesome would that have been? I mean, you had you had the uh, mullets versus the Mormons. You have mullets versus the Catholics in the same year. I mean, we're going through every religious denomination. <laughs> and so, um, but, you know, that's what 
makes the NCAA basketball tournament special is those matchups, those five twelves, those three fourteens, et cetera. And you have that in college football. And, and there might be no shot in the world that a team like us or whatever can win a national championship, but you never know. And to have that opportunity to be in the dance, you never know what happens that time of the year. I think that's a special thing. And for going forward, if that's exactly what happens, I mean, that gives all of, uh, all of us, you know, G5, so to speak. If we go out and handle our business and have a great year, we can get rewarded for it, where other times you never would. Even like last year, we had a great year. Cincinnati had a great year. Even BYU had a great year. And only one of us would have a chance to get to a, you know, really high-quality New Year's Day bowl, right, And instead of all three of us having a chance. If this was the same year, all three that all three of us are fighting the very last week to see who's getting ready to play for a national champ. Maybe maybe two out of three. That's a big deal, and uh, I, you know I, I think I think because of the season we had, the season Cincinnati had. Obviously, there's been talk about expanding, but I think we maybe expedited that a little bit just because of everybody saw the type of quality football that you play uh, at our in our conferences, and and I think people want to see that nationally. I think that BYU, our game and BYU, I think that really opened a lot of eyes for a lot of people across this country. Well, I want to talk about that game specifically because the way that it, we watched it, the way that we consumed it, and it was a hell of a football game as well, has done so much for the sport, as you mentioned, but how often does that game come up in just casual conversation as you're going about your daily activities? All the time. I, I don't know how many people actually watched it, but you can trip what the number of people said they watched it. <laughs> I mean, everybody, everybody just talks about, man, that game was this, that game was that. And, and I've shared with anybody that I've talked to about it, regardless if you were a fan of, uh, of either team, if you just watched that game, you were like, man, what a great game, obviously a great ending. Uh, and both teams competed uh, and did it on a short, you know, on a short time frame. And it was, it was arguably one of the best college football games of the year, you know, and, uh, and just to experience that, to have game day here on top of it, there were so many positive things. But everybody that once they find out, hey, Coastal, that's the first word out of their mouth. Man, that BYU game was X, Y, Z. Uh, and that's a that's a pretty special deal. And I want to see more of that. I, I'm a college football playoff expansion zealot. Got a T-shirt that says expand the playoff, you cowards, because I want to see teams like yours have an opportunity to chase a national championship. I think it's meaningful, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind a 16-team playoff myself. But last year, y'all put up 37 a game. You won a conference title. You finished 14th in the final AP poll. Uh, do you think perhaps, you know, that was in the cards when you joined the Sun Belt in 2017? Well, I, I tell you this. I'm sure our administration, you know, their, their mindset was, hey, we want to we play at a high level and, and go to bowl games, et cetera. I don't know if anybody would have dreamed. Uh, especially this early in, in our program and, and, and being an FBS, that was our fourth year in FBS. I don't know if anybody would dream if they did their line to you that uh, we would have been Sunbelt champions that early, would have been on national television 10 times uh, and had college game day in your stadium and, and then been high as number nine in the country and, and all over on the uh, every, every Tuesday for about eight weeks, we were in, you know, where they're talking about where the rankings were for the, for the playoff system, Coastal Carolina was mentioned every week, mm -hmm. uh, and you, you can't you can't put a price on how much that that brought to us and our program and, and our community. Uh, and, and but you know what? That's the beauty of sports. That's the beauty of college football. Uh, that's what I love about uh, you know coaching. When when you get something done that nobody thinks would ever happen, and you do it, it just makes it that much more meaningful and special. And and I think that just shows you truthfully what type of young people. In our program, we have that didn't care about what outside people thought about them. They cared about what the people in the room did, and, and a good thing happened with that. And 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 I know I'm realistic uh, that a lot of that happened because of COVID, right? Because the Pac-12 wasn't playing; they played late. Big Ten wasn't playing till late. So when they needed to fill some TV spaces there early, you know, Coast was on TV all the time, and and we took advantage of every opportunity. And uh, and it just kept building and building and building where it became, you know, we were America's team there for a year. Uh, hopefully it'll be longer. And so uh, it was a special time and, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we can continue to build off of what we did and, and continue to have some seasons like that and, and hopefully have another magical one where we can be, you know, playing for a national championship one day. Well, all you can ask is have an opportunity to play and take an opportunity to play. And I bring that up, right? Because a, you pointed it out, but I'm not taking anything away from that. I mean, you, you played who you played and they want to put you on TV. That's their prerogative. It's your job to go out there and win football games. And to that end, 
I know folks remember the BYU game. I understand it. But the one that really is your season for me, because I'm watching this because I'm, I'm a college football nut. I'll watch every game that's on TV if you let me. Y'all are down 38-35 on the road at Troy, okay? There's one minute, 20 seconds left. Troy goes and gets a, a score. Y'all start out the series 24-yard line. What are you thinking at that point? Well, I, I tell you what, you're, you're obviously thinking how, you know, the, 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 the doubt creeps in and going, you know, we came this far and, and we're, it looks like we're running out of gas. And then our, our quarterback who threw a pick the previous drive and gave them field position to where they uh, scored the go-ahead touchdown. Coach, don't worry about it. We got it. And we went down the field in five plays and scored just like that, like, like we were going on air almost. It was unbelievable. Uh, and there was not – even if there was a doubt in the mind of coaches, there was not a doubt in the mind of that team they were going to find a way to win. Uh, and I think that's what I remember about it the most. That was a great football game, uh, and we probably didn't have a, uh, a way to win that. But though, just the belief over there, there was never any doubt. Uh, and that's one that I do just remember vividly over there. In the, not one time there was a panic, not one time those players. You know, coaches might be, uh-oh, uh-oh. Not one time did they did they ever think, all right, we're done. They just went out there and, and, and played, and it was that was a pretty awesome time as well. We asked the kids to distinguish themselves. We asked them to turn themselves into stars, right? We asked them to be the person they claimed to be, and this is an instance where they did that, where they did not shake their faith. They went out and they went and got W. But to that point, Grayson McCall and Javon Hiley showed me something I'd never seen from them before. I mean, between the two of those guys, I think you had three catches of those five plays come from them. And, of course, the touchdown was McCall to Hiley. What do you see in particular in those two guys that people should know or that they don't know? Well, I would say one thing uh, about that relationship there, when Grayson was a freshman last year, right, a redshirt freshman. And so Javon was actually a season. He was a junior, but and and, and played a little bit as a freshman, played quite a bit as a sophomore. He's a, he was our basically our oldest seasoned receiver. Mm-hmm. And uh, Grayson really developed a trust with him early on. You know, when you're a young guy, you're looking for somebody out there. Hey, who can I count on when things aren't going well? And it was Javon for him. And they they have a special connection. And the thing I would say with Javon is that Javon uh, doesn't look like. When he goes out there, he's going to run past. He doesn't look like he's going to be this, don't be like that, but he just finds a way to make something happen. Uh, and what it did for Grayson, it, I think it helped Grayson's confidence grow from a guy that had confidence but just had it from, well, hey, I'm good. But then when he went out there knowing, hey, I got Javon, I can, I, when things go wrong, I can find. And those guys have a great connection as far as just that, you know, you study all the time, just those great connections. Montana to Rice, right, Young to Rice. Um, and my home's the hill right now, like in the NFL. There's just something where those guys, you know, they're looking for that. And they have that same one. And those uh, those guys are both uh, guys that weren't highly recruited, that play with a big chip on their shoulder with something to prove. And they go out and they've done special things when other people said, hey, you're not capable of doing this. And they've sort of done that together. And I think that makes it even better for them. One of the things I take from last season is not just that we got to watch y'all play football, but we got to see those kids grow up in in certain situations, certain ways. But also with y'all at the top, that Sun Belt's pretty tough. Like like that Troy game, people are writing it off. But Louisiana, I think you got a two-point win over them, and you were going to play them in a conference championship game that I couldn't wait to see. You share the co, fine. But I go up and down. That Sun Belt, and I got to ask you: You think it's the deepest conference in the country? I, I, I would share this with you. You know, uh, uh, there's not a week that goes by where you got you can roll the ball out and you're going to win because of the name on your chest. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. There, there's good coaches, there's good players, and the Sun Belt's a football league, and they, they've uh, most the majority of Sun Belt has invested heavily in the football being good resource wise. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously Louisiana's taken off on the West. I think you're going to see Arkansas State come back. Texas State's pouring some things into it. I think they're getting South Alabama built a brand-new facility. Road got a new coach. And over here on the East side, you got these traditional powers, right? I mean, boy, has been great for a long time. Uh, Georgia Southern was a great team for a long time. Obviously, uh, Appalachian State. Then you got us in Georgia State that are sort of the up-and-comers. Georgia State beats a Tennessee, you know, two years ago, whenever it was so – 
it's a great league. Uh, I think our side of the division is as tough as there is in college football at our at, at our level. I believe that. Uh, I mean, our five teams are tough, and then you get them there. So there's not a downtime at all. Uh, and I, I arguably, you know, obviously I, I have to say this, but I'd put us up against the AEC. I know that's who we get compared to quite a bit. I'd put us from top to bottom up against them any day. I know they've got some really, really good teams there. Um, but uh, I think our, our our conference is as tough as there is, and it's a challenge each week. I would add to that this, Coach. Uh, not only y'all win the Sun Belt, but the Sun Belt uh, turned the Big 12 into, a, you know, a Sun Belt, Sun Belt territory, if you will. I mean, y'all caked up Kansas Jayhawks, dipped them in some grease, okay? Then we get Arkansas State taking it to Kansas State. And then we get Louisiana beating up on an Iowa State team that won the Fiesta Bowl against one of those Pac-12 teams that started late, but again, against one of those Pac-12 teams that started late. And then you add in the BYU's part of this. I don't really see how we can continue not to see either a Sun Belt champ or even an American champ get into the playoff in this four-team field as it is, just based on what y'all have done in the cross conference. Am I reading this wrong? Well, you know what? I think that's a that's a hard sell, and our reason. Mm-hmm. That's a hard sell. We're always, uh, and I say we, you know, level-wise, ACL that, we're always going to get knocked for lack of power five, you know, uh, et cetera, uh, which is, which is uh, you know, a little bit of bull because, uh, again, we've challenged, we, we know how strong our schedules are and who we play. But I think that's, the, I think that, I think it's almost impossible the way the current setup is. Mm-hmm. It's almost possible for an AAC team. I mean, you look at UCF from 2000, was it 17, I think? Yes, sir. I mean, you know, they is about as dominant as anybody, and they didn't even sniff it. I don't, I don't even know what they were ranked at, at the end of that year. Maybe not ranked, but in the playoff rankings, maybe eighth, ninth. And so I think it's almost impossible to happen. And that's why I think we're all so excited about this 12 team, and eventually it'll probably go to 16, as you mentioned. I think we're all so excited about that because now, now hey, we don't have to be perfect and then hope somebody thinks we passed the eye test, right? Because that's it. Like last, even last year, the, the, the commissioner of, the, of the, the, the playoff system, well, we just think Cincinnati's better in Coastal. But even though our statistics and everything were better, they thought they were better based off the eye test, which that's their, that's their right. Uh, and that's what we're thankful going for. But no shot that any, any G5, so to speak, gets in the playoff the way it's currently set up, no matter what happens. I am against people in suits and boardrooms telling me what they think are the best teams. I want the kids to decide that. And we got the ultimate college football playoff selection committee called a scoreboard. That's what it's there for. And that's the way I want to see it go. And I can go on about that, but I want to keep talking about your team because coach, y'all go 11 and one, eight, no in the conference. Uh, Another way of saying this is we all see you coming now. Like we, we know who you are. How are y'all carrying that going into what I expect to be a really interesting preseason camp for you. Well, that you know that is a challenge. I mean, last year, last year, nobody thought much of anything, you know. And and we're we're circling teams, right? Hey, we're coming after you. We're coming. Well, this year it's, it's different. They're circling us, uh, and we're not going to sneak up on anybody. And I so I think I think as a head coach, what you've got to do, and what you have to have your team do is you got to keep that same mindset, that keep that keep hunt, that hungry attitude that we're still hunting, right? We've climbed the mountain, but we're not looking backwards. We're going to continue to climb to see if we can go to the next plateau. Uh, and uh, I think what happens sometimes when you have success, it's natural or easy to just look back and look at the success and, and relax a little bit. Uh, and the thing that we've challenged our, our players on is that we're, we're on a journey, and that journey didn't stop just because of what happened last year. That was just part of the journey getting there, and we've got to continue to push forward and climb and keep that edge, play with that edge. Because if we don't, we don't we don't win games at, at Coastal just because of talent. Now, we've got good talent, but it's not the best in the world by any means. And so we take our talent and we play for a purpose, and that's why we win football games. And so as a head coach, we've worked hard this offseason of making sure that why we win has been the forefront. Uh, and, I, you know, our, our senior leaders last year were tremendous. Mm. Most of those guys are back. You know, the majority of them, I think we lost, we had 15 seniors or 14, whatever it may be, and we got all but three back. And so a lot of great leadership is back to keep our younger people 
with their eyes focused on what we have to do on a daily basis. So I feel good about that direction, but it's, it's going to be a different, you're playing from a different, uh, you know, lead. You're, you're the lead horse, so to speak now, instead of coming up from the rear, you're in the front right now. And everybody's, everybody's chasing that one. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how our team responds to that, but I feel pretty good about the direction we've, we've had so far. I'm excited about it because as you mentioned, you get all those seniors back and we've seen a lot of kids take advantage of this year of eligibility. I think it's going to be the deepest season of college football that we've seen basically since scholarships were reduced in the nineties, because so many kids have been allowed and taken advantage of being able to come back. But I also wonder as you're going on this camp tour, you and your all around the country, you and your coaches, how often are other coaches coming up to you going, Hey, uh, can you, Tell me a little bit about that two back spread y'all run because <laughs> apparently it's all like among coaches and I'm not going to pretend that I'm a scheme guy, but they'll talk about it to the blue in the face. And I thought it was interesting just reading up on it that it felt like you went over to Wofford to figure out what they were doing while you were at North Greenville. Do I have that correct? Yeah, that's part of it. Yes, sir. So no, we, we have had quite a few people ask us about certain, some of those things. Uh, and uh, when, when my, I was a head coach at Division II in North Greenville my first year was 2009, uh, and we inherited a, a, a roster that had 17 scholarships in a 36 scholarship league. And so I figured out real quick, I'm going to have to try to do something different to try to, you know, win some games. And Wofford was doing some things that, that I was interested in at that time frame, doing some triple stuff out of the gun. And, but they didn't throw it much, but I wanted to learn the run games. Went over there and was fortunate enough to visit with them. Coach Ayers was their head coach then and, and let me sit down and just learn as much as I could from them. And and then you took what you knew from the passing game and you tried to combine it, you know, and it's obviously evolved over those years, but really the base principle of what we do from a run standpoint started back there in 2009 after that visit and we've just evolved from it. Now, you know, RPOs, going faster and all that stuff, you know, you add some of those things in obviously, but the base things, uh, and the base pass concepts and all really were from that 2009 visit. And uh, we've just tried to work on it over year after year and update it and fix it and, and uh, try to change it a little bit here and there. But uh, that visit was obviously worthwhile because it's been uh, – it's just now being on TV, this is the first time everybody sees it and says, oh, I'll actually like it. Everybody hates it. And then they see it and they, oh, I like this. So it's been interesting to see the different perspective of it. Everybody hated it. Now everybody wants to copy it. It's, it's funny. Winning cures everything, right? Everything looks good when you're winning. Like, nobody liked the wishbone, and then Oklahoma started winning championships with it. And like, Hey, I think we ought to run a little bit of that. I, I have this question for you, Coach. I give this to, to most of the coaches that are kind enough to join the show. How do you feel about name, image, and likeness showing up July 1 for most, I say most, for a lot of states and for a lot of programs? Does it scare you? Are you still figuring it out yourself? Are you enthusiastic about it? How do you feel? Well, I'm excited for the players and their opportunities. That, that gives them a chance to uh, use the platform they have and, and, and maybe take advantage of some of those things that people have obviously not had to do in the, have not had the opportunity to do in the past. So I, that I look forward to for them. I think that's a big deal. Uh, you know, there's some anxiousness from my side, and I think coaches' side, because we know we don't know exactly how it's going to work. How, how, you know, what's the monitoring, all the different things, and then also I think, you know, if your culture is important to you, you worry about if there's if there's certain things out there getting, uh, you know, getting paid, certain people getting paid for this, paid for that, and then the other people aren't. Does that affect that locker room, right? Does that affect your team bonding and stuff? And and maybe it won't. I don't know if anybody knows that answer, but there's so many. I think it's still unknowns of exactly how to play out and work. Uh, that there's some there's some anxiousness on the coaches side. Myself specifically, just what's this look like? You know, because coaches typically you have a plan and you hope you have an idea what things look like, and then you and then you adjust to things. Right when there's something, you adjust to it. I think right now nobody knows exactly what it looks like, so you don't know what to anticipate and expect. But uh, obviously, going forward, it's going to be a big deal here in our state. It's July one currently. It's July one of 2022. Uh, now that can change with the NCAA ruling coming out. I don't know exactly. So, you know, we're moving forward on the plan of having everything, you know, in place by then. So our, our, our roster can take advantage of opportunities they may have, but uh, I'd love to learn more about it, exactly how it's going to lay out. So we, we can all come up with a plan to, to maximize its benefits. 
I had this thought as I was going to do some research for the show and try to ask you what I thought were interesting questions. And it felt to me and everything that you have said, especially since uh, going 11 and one and winning the conference championship, that you're very happy at Coastal Carolina. And to that end, what makes you happy as a head coach? Like, what are you actually looking for? What does Coastal provide you that makes you content? Well, I think, I think one, you want to be at a place that you enjoy living, you enjoy raising your family. Uh, you know, coaching's hard and, and you want to, you want to be somewhere that you enjoy the place, you enjoy the people. And, and when you're not at the office, it's somewhere that you want to raise your family. And, and, and the Conway Myrtle Beach area here in South Carolina is a beautiful office right now, you know, over 15 minutes from the ocean. So there's a lot of great things with that. Uh, and so that, that's a benefit. But I think from a coaching standpoint, you, wherever you're at, no matter, no matter what they're paying you, all those things. I mean, that's obviously money's great, but it's more so do they value what you're doing? Do they, do they appreciate that? You know, and, and the one thing that I believe here, you know, with our leadership in place, they, they, they appreciate the value that we brought to the university and what we're trying to do. They support that. And when you feel like you're supported uh, from your administration and your community, that's a big deal because uh, I think, you know, they're, you know, other opportunities, obviously, that arise, there's always some type of skeleton in the closet, right? There's always something. Uh, and I think here, uh, we just scratched the surface of what I, I think this program and university have become. You know, we're on the bottom floor, really, and we're trying to continue to build this this foundation. And I think what we showed this year, that there's a, there's a high, high ceiling here uh, if we continue to push the envelope and continue to do the things that we're capable of, that this could this could be a place that consistently consistently is playing for the the Sun Belt Championship. But and if you're playing for the Sun Belt Championship, then you're playing for an opportunity to play for the national championship once this new playoffs is. And so I think there's something special about that doing something where it's never been done. Uh, and um, that that part excites me. And it parts our staff. Most of a lot of our staffs from the state of South Carolina, from the southeast. So there's a there's a natural just a regional fit for us and. Uh, I really enjoy the young people that we work with here as well. You know, and I think the hard part always happens, you know, this is a big school comes in and they offer you so much money. You know, it's, it, that's a hard, hard, obviously a hard challenge when you're talking about some life altering money, but then the day money doesn't make you, but give you joy. You know, your joy comes from your belief system and the foundation you have. And I really uh, enjoy and the fit that we are here. Our staff is here. We, we enjoy what we're doing and what we're building. Coach, I am enjoying the hell out of watching the program grow. I enjoy last year, and I expect to enjoy wholeheartedly watching y'all win a bunch of games in 2021. I want to wish you and your family a happy fourth, and thank you so much for joining us here on the number one ranked show. I appreciate it. Anytime. You guys are awesome, and uh, God bless y'all, and have a great uh, July 4th holiday. My thanks to Jamie Chadwell for joining the show. That was one of the most honest and cool interviews that we've been able to do on the show. And him just talking about why he wants to stay at Coastal Carolina and what he's looking for as a head coach was invaluable to me. And I'm sure makes the folks in Conway, South Carolina feel better. But that thought led me to another, which is which teams would I expect to make the college football playoff Sooner rather than later, and sooner being this year. Now, you heard Chadwell say he doesn't think that it's going to happen because the people in that room do not value the teams outside of the Autonomous Five, and I don't think that he's necessarily wrong. But I'm going to dream for a second. So I'm going to give you my five most likely teams to make the college football playoff outside of what we know as the Autonomous Five. And again, this means that I have to say out loud, Kansas and Vanderbilt, have a better chance to make the college football playoff than any of the teams that I'm about to tell you about, which again is asinine and stupid, okay? No disrespect to what Lance Leipold is doing or trying to build or what Clark Lee is trying to do or build. It is to say, program's been in the cellar for a very long time. And the teams I'm about to tell you about have been doing nothing but reeling off W's and winning titles, okay? Number one on the list, and we gotta talk about, Central Florida, okay? It's not just that they got Gus Malzahn as their head coach. It's also that they returned Dylan Gabriel and that I think Malzahn is built for this kind of a challenge, right? Auburn, I think, makes a mistake in letting that man get away, 
okay? First, you pay him all this money, and you forget that he's one of the only people to beat Nick Saban more than once. Which, again, that's usually the game here. Now, it's also like saying if Michigan were able to beat Ohio State that, you know, you want to keep Jim Harbaugh around. And right now, that's what they would take. That's my point here. You take that as a Michigan fan. You take the sort of success Gus Malzahn had at Auburn against Nick Saban at Alabama if you can get Jim Harbaugh to have that sort of success against Ryan Day. You take it. It's what you want, okay? And yet that man's in Central Florida. So he's in an already stout conference, but I also think that he's in the best position to recruit the hell out of Florida, and he's already doing that. They're setting up... They're setting up billboards outside of Gainesville to, to tell everybody what's really going down. Talking about, hey, we won the last national championship here, not Florida, which I think is, is awesome. Like, that's a sports talk radio topic. And the reason that that's a great sports talk radio topic is because everybody's got an opinion about it and nobody's right. Except me. I'm always right. Now, the next team on the list is Coastal Carolina. They return damn near everybody, and they got two of the better wide receiver quarterback tandems in the country today, right? And Javon Hiley and Grayson McCall. And you heard me recounting my favorite moment between those two, and really, I think, would put Coastal Carolina in a position to be one of those top teams going into 2020, just before getting selected for the Cure Bowl and then losing a dramatic game against Liberty. But I really think that them coming out of their side of the conference to play against another team in the Sun Belt is going to tell us which team is the best team or one of the best teams in the group of five, depending on what Central Florida and some others, quite honestly, in the American do. Because those, I think, are the two best group of five conferences in football today. But I like what they return. I like the offense that they run. I like the way that they've been able to recruit. And I like how their team seems to be more than just those two dudes, right? They are greater parts, right? They are greater than the sum of their parts, I should say. Number three on the list, okay? I got Louisiana, Billy Napier's Louisiana. Now, there is a great argument for Louisiana to be at the top of this list. And the one that it is, is they return 98% of last year's production, okay? So think about this. They lose a tailback in Elijah Mitchell. That's about it. They return everybody on defense. And behind Levi Lewis, they got Lance Lejean, who was at Mike Loxley Syracuse, or Syracuse, you mean Maryland. Don't, don't hate me, Terrapins. That's my bad. I have Don, not Don Nelson. What's Don's last name? I have another man on my mind right now that I was going to try to make an allusion to with Levi Lewis. But if you want to dunk on me for saying Syracuse, I'll let you have it. He was at Maryland. He transferred to Louisiana. That's my bad. But they also played Coastal Carolina very, very close. Okay? They lost that game 20-18. to 18. And many people thought that if they got to play the Sun Belt Championship, that Louisiana had more than a fair shot to knock off that Coastal Carolina team. It got canceled due to COVID. They were co-champs. But we all wanted to see it. And we all knew that Billy Napier was one of those dudes that was up for one of these Power 5 jobs ends up saying no to Tennessee and some others. I think he's waiting on one job in particular. And I don't really want to say what that job is. I just want to say that if they don't have that, that program together quick, fast, and in a hurry this year, they might go get them one Billy Napier. Okay, number four on the list. I got Boise State. Okay? I understand that losing Brian Harson to Auburn might do something, but when I talk to Boise State people, they're like, we don't know that he was really that good. Because we wanted something more. It wasn't like he was Chris Peterson. Going, yo, okay. And then the guy they hired, Andy Avalos, was the fits coordinator at Oregon. Comes over, comes back home, where he understands what they are and what the program needs. But he's also going into year one. And Central Florida and uh, Boise State play each other this year. Which is going to be so much fun. Because one of these is going to knock off the other. And I don't think you're going to be able to make the college football playoff with a loss to a group of five team. No matter how good that group of five team is. But what a way for the Boise State Broncos to announce themselves in the first year, Andy Avalos, with a win against Gus Malzahn in Central Florida. That'd be a big deal. That'd be a lot of fun. Last team on the list, for which I'm sure y'all got words for me, Cincinnati. Okay? I look at who Cincinnati put into the NFL. I look at who they return. 
And I'm going, you got a lot here. Because Danny knows is your running back coach, and that dude's now your quarterback's coach over at Maryland, okay? Was quarterback's coach over at Alabama. I think that's a big loss for you. The bigger loss is Marcus Freeman. I don't believe in a whole hell of a lot of assistance the way that I believe in Marcus Freeman. I have been stumping for Marcus Freeman to get a Power 5 head coaching job for three years. Because all he's been doing at Cincinnati is turning that defense into ah real monsters. Okay? Them dudes is coming down to fight the Looney Tunes. They that good with Marcus Freeman as their defensive coordinator. He's now at Notre Dame. And he's got this absolute superhero in Kyle Hamilton that I can't wait to see what he does with. But I'm also not that big a believer in Desmond Ritter. I'm just not. I understand that there are a lot of people that are, but I don't see it. Y'all know that I went to the University of Tulsa, okay? You know that I watch a lot of American football. I watch Tulsa play Cincinnati basically for the championship. I ain't see it in Desmond Ritter. I ain't see it, okay? I saw a dude named Zach Wilson going, or Zach Wilson. I saw a dude named Zach Smith going head to head with the dude, and I was like, I don't see a big difference. And no disrespect to Zach Smith, but he wasn't exactly the best Tulsa quarterback we ever had, right? I mean, David Johnson got more claim to that than he does, and Paul Smith is looking at us going, yo, RJ, I'm still here. I know, that's kind of my point. So those are my five. Central Florida, Coastal Carolina, Louisiana, Boise State, and Cincinnati. If you think I left somebody off, tweet us, reply to us on uh, IG, Facebook, wherever it is, with who you think that is. Or if you got a problem with my list, make your own list. Tell me about it. Give me your reasoning. I'll listen. I might not agree, but I'll listen. All right. Now I want to do your favorite segment on the show. We out here. And for that, I want to bring in Produce Cat. All right, people are not happy with you, um, or they or they have lots of things to say. This one is from at Milton the Fourth. Okay. Both are freaks. Vince has the size and is a total natural, but Kyler is much more accurate. Kyler has a fo- higher football IQ, so Kyler by a nose. I don't like the football IQ part of that argument. Uh, because it's disparaging to Vince Young in a way that I think is disingenuous because football IQ is what the results say they are. And the results say that in a Texas spread, it was Vince Young and Jamal Charles going, hey, it's either me or him, how you want to die. I like that. I, I also like that Kyler Murray is just that dude. But I'm, Kat, when I tweeted the graphic, right, because JV on center from the show account asking a question and I just said pick one I didn't give my opinion in the tweet So for people to get upset with me and the way that people were talking I'm like, okay I'm I am the ground that you're fighting on because I decided to ask you which one of these greatest all-time quarterbacks would you pick and I didn't mind along party lines, okay like that that that's easier for me I picked it easy. It's easy for me because I'm not a neutral Right? Like, if it comes to an OU in Texas, you understand. I'm in Oklahoma. Okay? That's what it is. But I'm also just not going to let you come through here and tell me about football IQ. When Vince Young was the best player in 2005, and he proved it to Reggie Bush and them in 2005. Just me. What else you got, Priest Cat? Okay, this one is from at Marco Polo 1168. No disrespect to Kyler because he was damn good. Vince Young led his team to a natty with a performance that everyone still talks about even today. Easy call to make, Vince Young. Again, it's only easy if we're talking about winning championships, right? But that's not what makes the, the question fun for me, right? Because if you were paying attention, I got Vince Young as the third best college football player of all time, right? And that is me trying to do this as neutrally as I can and doing that list. But if I'm asking me between between OU and Texas, I'm going to go with Kyler Murray, right? That said, it's not just that Vince Young is that dude. It's that he's the first guy to pass for 3,000 and rush for 1,000 in a season. And Kyler is only the second player to pass for 4,000 and rush for 1,000 in a season. Now, 
what would have been really interesting is if the 2018 Oklahoma defense was worth a damn and could have competed for a national championship because Kyler still went to work. Now, Quentin Williams got to him and, and brought him down, but he still went to work against the Alabama defense. What he has no say over is whether or not the Oklahoma defense wanted any truck with Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, into a tongue of Aloha to say nothing of Tulsa's own Josh Jacobs running a train over the top of Robert Barnes' dead body. Okay? Kyler Murray ain't have nothing to do with that. Nothing at all. He can't tackle. He can only play quarterback. So I don't know how easy it is, right? But I understand your reasoning. This last one is definitely the sassiest of the responses that I pulled. This is from at Matt Prostco. Sure. What a joke. What an insult to Vince Young. Maybe the best college quarterback and in the discussion for the best college player, dot, 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 ever. What's his name again? What's his first name? Matt. Okay. Matt. Matt, look at the camera. Look at the camera, Matt, because you're that type, okay? You're that, you that type. I know you're here. I know you're watching because you're that type. Why did you pull up to my porch if you thought this was such a joke, okay? I stood on my porch. I asked a question, and you come back with the question is a joke on my front yard, Okay? If it is such a joke, you don't feel inspired to comment, okay? I see your tweets. I see everybody's tweets. I don't reply to everybody. I'll give you an example, okay? I'll give you an example of somebody who blocked me since uh, all the people care about whom I block. I had said, if you are going to do name, image, and likeness, pay, let those kids get their money today because, okay, because you don't want me to take three years of your checks and put them in escrow, okay? To which y'all would say they're an adult, and I'd say if they can vote, they can fight for this country, they're adults, pay them their money. To which I had a bunch of people reply to me, but the person I chose to take issue with was a person who claimed to be a financial counselor. And her whole bit was, I think there are grifters out there that are going to try to steal from the kids. And I said, who manages your money? And she said, do you read my bio? I said, of course I do. Why do you think I'm coming after you? Because you're trying to get some sort of percentage fee off of these kids or even these universities to manage their money, which is why I'm calling you out because that's kind of evil. She blocked me. I chose to pull up to her porch after she chose to pull up to mine because I can do this too. Okay. But I do appreciate you coming out with your whole chest, even if I don't think that you have a reason, right? You had a great lead there, right? You can start with what a joke and then give an opinion and an argument, because I, I want to make sure I get this clear. I need to start saying this with every we out your statement. When you come through my city, that is take city, carry a magically endowed sigil, because we the type to bring a flamethrower to a candlelight vigil, okay? We are not taking prisoners here. This is not your daddy's Facebook page. Build an argument. I don't care about your declarative sentence. I don't care about your opinion. I care about what are the other 800 words behind what, is, what a joke. Because if I come after the Heisman Trophy, you better doggone know well I'm coming correct. Because I have to. You want to get on the show? You want to come out here with your little opinions? Cool. Tell me exactly why. Because I can't wait to tell y'all that y'all did a good job. You're a smart college football fan. Otherwise, you're not listening to this show. Okay? So, my mans, come with an argument to go with your opinion. But don't come up here just saying that it's a joke and just go by. I mean, that's a drive-by. I don't need drive-bys in my porch. That's, that's how people get dead. Like, let's not do that. Okay? Come. Have an argument with me. Let's do this discussion thing. Let's do the discourse thing. And let's see if we can't whittle it down. That was the point, right? Give these big overarching greatest of all time arguments and see if you can come up with one really good germane point. All right, Producer Cat, is that all we got? All right, thank y'all 
for listening, downloading the number one ranked show. I'm having a ball. Producer Cat does an outstanding job helping me put together this rundown every single week. Shout out to director Chris Cheshire, who is walking me through some troubleshooting as we're trying to give you a better video product here. And I think we have, and I think we're going to keep trying to do this. Javion is out here doing the Lord's work, right, on the socials. These graphics y'all comment on, these things that inspire you to do the drive-by, that's him. He's that good at this. Krista Scott executively produces the show. Congratulations to her. She just had a personal milestone. Very excited for her. Very excited for her to get back. And we will see y'all next week on the number one ranked show. Doses. <laughs>